Welcome back to season four of the Read Connected podcast. This season is all about connection. Connection with others, connection with something outside of yourself, and connection within yourself. And today's topic is childhood bullying. It's a topic that has garnered a lot of attention in the past two plus decades. And bullying is such a big topic that we couldn't just bring on one expert. No, we had to bring on two. And so today, we're going to bring onto the podcast two psychologists who are experts on the topic of bullying in their own right. And you might be asking, how did Jerry get two of them to come on the podcast? Well, let's take a trip down memory lane. Back in 2011, I was accepted into and just started the doctoral program in counseling psychology at Boston University. And the stars really aligned for me because our program recently just hired a new faculty whose specialty is in bullying research. And her name is Dr. Melissa Holt. And she was smart as a whip, had a heart of gold, and she welcomed me with open mind and open arms. And as time went on, the Social Adjustment and Bullying Prevention Lab, which is currently at Boston University, took shape at BU, and Melissa joined forces with Dr. Jennifer Greif Green, whose specialty is in school psychology, and who I had an equally positive experience with throughout my time at BU. I could not be more fortunate to have these two as my mentors over the years of my doctoral training. And now to introduce my two mentors as a doctoral student at BU. Dr. Melissa Holt is a professor in counseling psychology at Boston University Wheela College of Education and Human Development and a licensed psychologist. She's also the director of the Kilichand Honors College at Boston University. Dr. Holt's extensive research portfolio, which includes countless publications, editorial review positions, and even funding from the National Institute of Justice explores the way in which the adolescents experience bias-based harassment and bullying, which is aggression that targets another person's identity, and how schools can improve their overall culture and climate to reduce these negative experiences and support those who experience it. Dr. Jennifer Greif Green is a professor in special education and a clinical child psychologist at Boston University Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. Her research focuses on supporting students with emotional, behavioral disorders, and bullying prevention. Within these lines of research, she studies teacher identification of students with mental health needs, racial, ethnic disparities in mental health services access, and youth bullying involvement. She also co-directs the Social Adjustment and Bullying Prevention Laboratory with Melissa. Dr. Green has developed surveys to assess bullying in schools and has evaluated school-based bullying prevention and mental health promotion programs. She collaborates with a number of local schools and districts to support school social emotional well-being and reducing bullying. Her work has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, Spencer Foundation, and Metro West Community Health Foundation. We're super excited to have them both here with us today. Okay, so bullying and interpersonal aggression of all forms did not just start in the past 20 years or so when schools and society as a whole began talking about this topic and and really taking it seriously. Human beings have always hurt each other in one form or another. It's a timeless, sad tale, unfortunately. And however, over the past 20 years or so, our field and society as a whole really has tried to study and better understand these dynamics to make them better. It is an honorable pursuit that these two psychologists have dedicated their entire professional lives in pursuit of helping people get along, treat each other better, more respectfully, um, and to really reduce bullying and to support those who are bullied. So let's dive in and learn as much as we can today from these experts. So I think what we do here uh, in our episodes is we really try to start broad with topics because um, the people listening may or may not have been exposed to the topics that we discuss. So um, let's start broadly um, with this topic of bullying. We can really go in any direction, but let's just start in general with, you know, what exactly is bullying? People ask this question a lot, right? It's kind of the, 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 the timeless question of, is this bullying? Is this not? And, and families, kids, teachers will kind of come up with examples and say, um, this was or this wasn't. And so could we be clear about, you know, what the definition of bullying really is? And also, where did that definition even come from? Like, how did, how do we formulate that as a field? Can, can we just, oh, can we just start by thanking you for having us here today and just saying how great it is as faculty to be able to 
watch your progression through the program and as a professional and leading this podcast um, together and just like what a pleasure it is for us to be able to come back and hear and work with you on this podcast years later. Absolutely. To echo those things, it's just amazing to, to see that progression and also that you're taking on this topic, which I do think is so important and to see that it's it's been something that you started taking on as a student and are now still taking on both in this capacity and also I know it comes up in your clinical work. So just kudos to both of you. Thank you so much Thank to you. both of you. Um, well, I can take that question, uh, Jerry, about what is bullying. I think it's an important one. And I think when we're working with schools, it's something, as you said, comes up a lot about what is bullying and did what my child experienced, for example, meet that threshold. So when you think about bullying, um, the initial definition really came out, again, like you said, quite a long time ago. We, we think about a few components. So it's typically thought about as interactions between peers in which there's intentional harm, there's an imbalance of power, and often these actions are repeated. Um, interestingly, there have been some new thoughts around the definition that were first presented in 2023 in the fall at the World Anti-Bullying Forum. And a group of scholars collaborating with UNESCO put forward a slightly more nuanced definition of bullying. And I wanted to just talk about a couple of those elements that came out. Mm. So they talked about school bullying to be a damaging social process driven by social, societal, and institutional norms that is manifested as unwanted interpersonal behavior among students or school personnel. So you can see just some of the additional nuance there. Mm -hmm. The definition also calls out the harms that come to those who are targeted by bullying, and importantly, both at the individual, group, and community levels. So harms that are occurring across the ecology. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so so just to kind of summarize the the uh, the intent. So there's three elements that were originally formulated: the intent, mm -hmm. the power imbalance, mm -hmm. and uh, the repeated nature of it. So as an example, the intent meaning the person you're saying the the intent to harm somebody, like to That's actually right. make someone feel uncomfortable, discomfort, pain, or some sort of suffering. And is it the UNES is that the the World Bullying uh, is it the association? Um, it, well, the World Anti-Bullying Forum is essentially a, a conference, a group of scholars and practitioners that come together every couple of years at that forum, um, a group of scholars that have been collaborating with UNESCO. So, But that uh, international group was working with a group of scholars around the world to think through what a new definition might look like. And what they came out with kept some of those elements that we mm -hmm. have thought of always as the key elements of bullying, but I think really added some nuance to it in terms of thinking about what it's driven by, those norms at mm -hmm. different levels of the ecology. Um, um, and also, I think that the harms really can occur both to the individual, but also to um, groups and communities, mm -hmm. which is a bit different, I think, than our initial definition and how we were thinking about it. Now, this has not necessarily been picked up widely, um, but I'd attended that conference and made note of how some of the um, elements have shifted a little bit in terms of how the international community of scholars may be thinking about bullying at this point. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that they um, added that element of the environment reinforcing it? That must have come from a lot of the literature on um, like the dynamics that, that happen within bullying, I, I imagine. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I can't speak to specifically why that group decided to, but I think based on the research, we do know that bullying is reinforced by various aspects of um, the environment, you know, both at the group level, the classroom level, the school level, and so forth. So it makes sense to me, at least, that this is now integrated into the definition of, of our understanding of bullying. Right. And that power dynamic part that you said, just for the listener to understand the power differential, mm -hmm. um, which is a big part and part of the um, questionnaires that come about for bullying, which Jen created one of them. Mm -hmm. So the power di the power differential would be any type of power that one individual has over the other. And there's a lot of different forms of that. Jen, do you mind speaking to um, the different forms? Because I know that's part of your questionnaire as well, looking at the different forms of the power differential. Yeah, I and mean, one of the most important things that distinguishes bullying from other forms of peer aggression is this idea of a power difference. So it's not two friends who are fighting one day and then friends the next day and then fighting again. Um, 
the idea is that bullying is specifically a relationship where one person has more power and the other person can't effectively defend themselves against the person who's bullying them. And as you mentioned, this power can come in a lot of different forms. It might be, um, it's it's often social power. So it might be that someone has more kind of popularity or more kind of social success behind them. Um, it could be kind of structural kinds of power. We know that um, youth who are minoritized are more often um, in some contexts, the uh, the target of bullying than their peers are. Um, so there are a lot of different kind of formats that this power can um, can show up in. But it's it's important in terms of distinguishing bullying from um, other types of peer relationships. Interesting. Yeah, and that popularity piece from what I from what I learned in the literature too is that bullies actually can be quite popular. That it's not a kind of stereotypical image of a like a movie scene of some bully who just like nobody really likes, but they're just bullying everyone that actually they could be kind of the ringleader of their social group um, and be quite popular as well. Yeah. For some, for some students, bullying serves the function of increasing their popularity. So by putting someone else down, they're able to um, gain more social support and gain more popularity among their peers. Um, And so bullying can be kind of a a catalyst or a leverage point for more popularity for some students. Mm. And then that goes back to the repeated nature that bullying has to be repeated. So that really explains why the repetitive nature of it is that to maintain it, things have to keep happening to maintain the status. I mean, the idea there is that bullying is a relationship. It's not a one-time interaction Mm -hmm. that it's happening over and over again. And that makes it different from kind of a a one-off problem or an assault um, which might happen just once the bullying is a, a pattern in a peer relationship. Mm. And it's not necessarily like a, like a conflict in terms of we have a disagreement or my friend is not letting me play a game that he wants to play um, necessarily. Like there has to be like, I want to make this person feel bad. I'm doing it on purpose. Where Because sometimes I think the tricky part, maybe we can try to clarify that, like when it's, peers can have conflict that is part of growing up and learning how to navigate differences or or to communicate in a way that can find compromise or like they have a hard time because developmentally maybe they don't know how to resolve conflict. That's actually a skill that even adults have a hard time with, right? So um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about that um, before moving on, just about the difference between kind of conflict resolution and also uh, for what I learned about the literature too, when it is really bullying, conflict resolution is actually the opposite of what you want to do to help somebody, right? So, mm-hmm. so maybe we can kind of bring that in as well. Yeah, and the idea behind the power imbalance is that the person who's being bullied can't defend themselves and and can't be an equal in conversations around conflict. And when you think mm-hmm. about conflict between peers and teaching conflict resolution skills, a lot of the strategies that we use assume an equal footing so that people can... Um, discuss their conflict and um, resolve a conflict as equals. And one of the challenges of um, of bullying is that the person who's being targeted is not able to successfully um, manage that conflict or uh, stop bullying from occurring. Yeah, no, I think that's right. So I think among friends, generally we wouldn't think of there as being a power imbalance, that if you're friends, there's generally equal set of power and you may experience conflict. But if yeah, you're in a friendship group, you both maintain similar levels of power and could potentially have the capacity to engage in conflict resolution. Um, I think it's such an important distinction because I hear all the time from from kids that will throw this terminology around. And I think in our our world where a lot of clinical terms are used just in common vernacular, I think it's really difficult to pull apart actually what bullying is. Mm. Because a lot of kids who do end up in some conflictual situations, they might feel as though they are being targeted in that moment just because that is kind of their experience that they're hyper-focused on, especially individuals in my work where they might not have like fully developed executive function skills and it's hard for them to zoom out and see the bigger picture of what's happening from their perspective. So I think it's so important. I wonder if there's anything before we move on from the definition of bullying mm-hmm. that you would offer to to parents, caregivers, or educators just to think about how language and semantics around these different situations is so powerful and important because it really could dictate the trajectory of what happens next in these situations. Mm. Jen, you can certainly speak on this where your research about um, identifying as being bullied, right? And so... Maybe I can summarize it. You can tell me if it's accurate or not. But <laughs> your research has suggested that if kids read something that says, were you bullied, they may or may not say yes. But if they have a definition of a bull- of being bullied without the word bullied, 
and it's just these things happen to me, which is essentially bullying without saying the word bullying, that they may more likely be able, they may be more likely to identify those behaviors happening to them without, but they, but not, they're going to say, no, I wasn't actually bullied. So maybe you can speak about that language piece that I think, I guess Alexis is referring to. Yeah, the idea is that the word bullying is used so commonly um, in our society and in news sources and to describe a whole wide range of different relationships, um, mm-hmm. including adults to children, children to adults, adults to adults, and you know, in mm-hmm. all different contexts, mm-hmm. um, that when we, as you mentioned, Jerry, ask students, have you been bullied? We don't, if we just use the word, we don't necessarily know what what they're referencing when they're answering that question, what they're imagining bullying is. Mm. So in our work, we have tried to ask about all the defining characteristics of bullying without using the word bullying. So we ask students, have you experienced aggression that's repeated? Have you experienced aggression where there's a, an imbalance of power? Um, where the, And we ask it in more child-friendly ways, of course, but um, and where there's um, intentional aggression towards you. And if we don't use the word bullying, as you noted, different students will say yes to those questions than if we say, have you been bullied? Mm. And we suspect that's because, again, when you ask someone, have you been bullied, um, they might be picturing something that they've heard on the news or that they Mm. saw in a movie or that they've heard from their friends, but it may not be the same definition as how we as researchers have learned to think about bullying. Yeah, it makes me think of how important psychotherapy is and like how like the more and the more you do psychotherapy, the more you realize don't make assumptions about what's going on in a person's life until you actually ask them about it. Mm. And until they have the opportunity to open up and express like things that maybe they have a hard time even talking about. So I think to to all of our points here is like um to really understand what's going on if this is happening in your school or to your kid, like certainly Helping someone feel comfortable to open up, giving them that space, whether that's, you know, whoever that's with. And maybe it is a psychotherapist that creates that context to really open up and share specifically what's going on and how they feel about it also. Because how they feel is equally important, right? Because um, people can be in denial about how things are affecting them, right? You know, and not really admit because they don't want to um, feel vulnerable or maybe they're afraid of the consequences, like any type of trauma people experience. Like a lot of the fear sometimes is, well, if I say something about it, um, it'll get worse because of the fear of that power imbalance, right? So um, I think this is just a plug for for psychotherapy, how important that context is for people. <laughs> I think it's also so challenging too. I speak so much about how like children often don't have the language to describe how they're feeling, right? And oftentimes they might read a book or hear about like the bully character in the book or in a cartoon. And that's their point of reference. And we talk a lot on the podcast about how as you get older, you have different data points that like inform how we think about the world, how we see the world or the schemas that we form in our brains um, that help us to better describe things. So I wonder if like, I imagine that's probably a challenge in your work too, to be able to like tease apart like like you were saying, like the characteristics of the experience versus the word itself. And maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit because I know that you've also designed some programs to help school systems and thinking about how we can better support individuals who have been bullied or to try to diffuse some of these aggressive behaviors. Um, I wonder if there's like anything that has come from your work that allows for you to better help even the young person if they aren't in therapy to describe some of their experiences. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can definitely speak to that. And I was just thinking about one piece just to circle back a little bit yeah. that um, that you were both alluding to in terms of sort of the child's experience and then versus the label. I think the other important thing to keep in mind is, you know, sort of a child could or could not be bullied. But for example, if they're experiencing a lot of conflict with friends, that still may warrant time mm-hmm. with a counselor to address the conflict with friends. For sure. It's sort mm-hmm. of just that the particular intervention at a school level where schools have mandates to address bullying in a particular way may look a little different if it's being the criteria for bullying. But, you know, the child's feelings, of course, are going to need to be addressed regardless. Mm-hmm. So I think that's also where it can get a bit murky um, in terms of how schools may want to be providing support or would need to be providing for supports for students, regardless of what kind of experience they're having and what label is associated with it. Totally. Um, and I think that often when we think about the kind of programs, to your point, um, often, you know, we can think about bullying prevention programs, but they often have that social uh, emotional program lens that's going to capture a wider range of experiences that students have that include but also extend beyond bullying that get at um, 
just, you know, again, a wider range of experiences that students may have within school um, that then can link them to the appropriate supports. I think this question of pers- whose perspective you're listening to and how you how mm. important it is to understand youth perspective is mm. really key. You mentioned um, the characteristic of intentionality before, and one of the things that's tricky in defining bullying is who gets to determine if it's mm. intentional or mm. on purpose. Is it the person who's doing the bullying? If I think I'm doing it on purpose, is it the person who's being targeted? Do I feel like it's happening to me on purpose? Mm. Um, I mean, even things that may seem simple, like figuring out if something was done on purpose can actually be pretty complicated to try to understand because different people may have different perspectives or understanding of the situation. Mm, that's so true. So even the bully, the person doing the bullying may not have a clear idea of what they're doing or if it kind of is bullying or not. Um, that's true. And that also goes into the literature on moral disengagement, which is basically suggesting that people who do bullying behaviors um, could continue the bullying because they're diminishing the effects it's actually having. And whether that's intentional or not is to be determined by the individual, right? We don't really know what's going on through the kid's head who's doing the bullying, but um, the idea of like, they'll say, well, it's not that bad or they deserve it or we're just fooling around, it's not a big deal is what moral disengagement is. And so Again, so what we're kind of alluding to here is the context matters, the the individual matters, and trying to really understand what's going on to help make it better is important. So trying to understand, like, is is the kid really um, diminishing the impact it could be having, and is that intentional, or is that just ignorance that they don't really understand, or or they're just caught up in the culture, like you alluded, alluded to, the culture is so important that they just mm-hmm. feel like it's normal. And I think, again, back to the individual, I think we always try to bring it back to the individual. Some kids may be fine with it, and then the more vulnerable kids are going to be really affected, and nobody would know, because when the culture is one-size-fits-all, oh, well, it, it's fine, because everyone's doing it, and we all quote unquote, agree that it's fine, you're missing the point. Like not everyone's the same. There could be kids who like have like really horrible things going on in their personal life um, or that it makes them way more vulnerable to something that seems innocuous, something, meaning that it just seems like it's not a big deal when really it is a really big deal. So I guess, you know, I'm always emphasizing the individual because if people are different and you got to try to understand what's going on to help a situation on individual levels as much as we do on the collective um, and, and see how those two things interact, the collective and the individual. Yeah. But again, there may not be that power imbalance, but there very much could be. And, and also people could, even if there isn't an empower imbalance, to your point, people could be affected whether or not there's a power imbalance. Yeah. We don't have to say this is bullying or not to, to, to say this is not helpful for certain people as well. So we also shouldn't get too caught up in like, as Melissa said, is this exactly bullying or exactly not? Because mm-hmm. kids could be affected just depending on the context and the person that we're talking about. Yeah, I was also going to say, I think the the piece that is also helpful to think about is from the kids engaging in more of the perpetration of behavior side of things, that developmentally, it's important for them to have opportunities to to learn that maybe what they're doing is not appropriate. And so I think getting that feedback that for this given child who experienced the behavior from um, someone engaging in perpetration, that that did not feel good to them and it was harmful. And so, you know, that's why we think about not zero tolerance is not always good because it gives, you know, someone who developmentally maybe doesn't, you know, understand the impact of their behavior, the opportunity to say, okay, I can take that in and understand and, you know, ideally then not engage in that behavior moving forward, right? So um, for all kids, they're, you know, they're, kids are young, they're learning things, they're learning how to interact. Mm-hmm. They, you know, maybe have had modeling that suggests that behavior was okay. So on both sides, sort of learning how to support someone being targeted to get the supports they need to to say to someone, this happened and it didn't feel good to me. How can I get support? And for the person engaging in the behavior to get the feedback, this hurt someone. Can we think about, you know, how to engage differently? That's such a good point. I am frequently reminding educators from an executive function perspective that all of these behaviors are oftentimes telling a story of some needs, some skill that still needs to be developed. And and to your point, a, a lot of hurt people or potentially individuals who are impulsive, who might not have the correct language to describe what they're experiencing, might actually project their uh, what comes out as aggression onto somebody else unknowingly while well, they're still developing their social skills. They're still understanding the discrepancy between what is and is not 
you know, socially acceptable or harmful or helpful to other people. And even developing a sense of self. So like totally. if we're saying that bullying manifests as a power imbalance to have power over another person, to mm-hmm. make yourself feel better, to have popularity or whatever the power is. I mean, to me as a therapist, that inherently suggests you don't feel good enough about yourself to just be who you are without feeling good by putting someone else down. Um, to help the person who's being bullied is um, like how... How can that person realize that this is not the way to feel good about yourself? There's there's a whole different way that you can feel good about yourself, which is so much of what therapy is for literally everybody I work with. Mm-hmm. How can you feel good about yourself in more healthy ways? It's a maladaptive way of feeling good about yourself. And Melissa's point that she said earlier, like there are risk factors that mm-hmm. lead kids to bully in the first place. It could be modeled, right? If they're just in an environment, um, maybe their their overall community and where they grew up or their family or something that they just don't see models of um, more positive ways of real, relating with each other. And so, th- as you said, Melissa, the zero tolerance policy may not work for everybody, perhaps because maybe the kid maybe it's not the negative punishment that's going to help. It's going to be the positive reinforcement of shifting, maybe becoming, you know, realizing that being a positive leader is actually a, also a good way. And that could become, you know, hopefully the, the, the school can reinforce being a positive leader uh, or, or, you know, that's why the bystander um, interventions are so much more helpful because they get other people to positively reinforce more positive behaviors where, I mean, if we want to feel good about ourselves, why not do it in a more positive way than a negative way? By the way, treating someone poorly is so easy. You know, I think this is the, I don't know how else to say this, but it's the easy way to get to feel good about yourself. Anybody can just like talk badly about someone and make someone feel badly. It's one of the easiest things to do, right? You could just you just make someone feel bad. Like to, to be nice to people and be respectful and to find ways to get along with people, even if you don't like them or disagree with them or or want to feel good about yourself, that takes work because you might have to work on yourself. You might have to work on learning how to get along with different types of people. That takes work. It's easy to make someone feel bad. So, you know, let you know, I'm really focusing on trying to understand the mind of the bully to to the person doing the bullying to Really, you're thinking out loud here, but <laughs> I think you're getting at the idea that for for a lot of people, bullying works. I mean, bullying works to get people what they want, and they keep yes. bullying because it works to get them what they want. Um, and I think you're speaking to the importance of figuring out what function does the bullying serve, and are, is there mm-hmm. other ways that we can meet that function for a student so that they um, don't need to bully to get what they need and to get what they want. And um, Alexis, as you were talking earlier, I was thinking that you know, for some students, um, they bully as a to fun, for the function of gaining power or gaining prestige. Um, and for other students you might work with, they might be bullying because it's kind of impulsive or reactive and not mm-hmm. as proactive. And um, we want to be responding really differently to that, depending on the reasons why it's mm-hmm. important to tease out. Um, why someone is involved in bullying other people because the intervention for someone who's planning ahead and figuring out how to bully Mm. someone and doing it as a way to purposely gain power is going to look very different than the intervention for someone who's um, kind of impulsive and saying things that maybe they don't mean to be hurtful, but they're, but they're saying things that are hurtful over and over again anyway. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. There's nothing more powerful that I've seen in my practice than someone who truly is like struggling so much with their own mental health that the, they're really affecting the people around them, whether it's their family, their friends, their significant others, where it's just everybody's walking on eggshells around them because they're, they're just so uh, irritable and just because of their own suffering. And for them to change that and to get along with people again because they've done the work on themselves is for one of the most incredible things I've ever seen like in my practice. And I, I give the person who does that so much credit. And hopefully this is a model for, for hope that that could happen for other people too. I think this is such an interesting discussion because as you said, Jer, we don't usually focus on the bully. We usually focus on the victim and how it impacts the greater ecology of the community around them. I wonder from your perspective and your work, what have you seen in like, again, some of the indicators of what might lead to bullying, if we can kind of break that down a little bit further, I think it'd be interesting for the audience to hear too. From the bullying perpetration perspective or from all? The kind of like the profile of those who tend to bully. Jen's looking at me. <laughs> oh, I think you've done, you've done a lot of work yeah. in this area. No, I can take a look. Um, well, I guess one thing before, just to, to talk about sort of the profile 
piece because because I also think that's really nuanced and I don't think there's yeah. one profile. Yeah, but I guess I also want to highlight just in the conversations, I think one of the pieces in my work around um, kids who bully that's been important to me is we can generally, generally there's this conception of bullying perpetrators as kids who are more externalizing and mm. perpetrating. And I think the, the, the piece that to know about those kids is they also have high levels of internalizing behaviors and are more likely to consider suicide and mm. and things like that, which I think can be um, lost along the way. And I think to Jen's point earlier about thinking about interventions and and supports, I think that's a really important piece to think about when we think about kids who believe that they're not just needing the support for the perpetrating behaviors, but they also are often suffering in terms of the internalizing concerns as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's just something to to, to think about. Um, again, I think that who we think about as someone who might engage in bullying can look just really different. I think there's lots of different reasons. Both of you have raised some before. I mean, it may be someone who's doing it more impulsively. It may be someone who's you know premeditated. It could be someone who's seeing it modeled at home or there's a school culture that's modeling it. Um, someone who's higher in moral disengagement. Um, someone who just um, generally um, tends to be more aggressive. Um, we know that peers matter. If you're in a peer group that's more aggressive, you will become more aggressive and engage in more bullying over time. Um, so I think it's not one factor. I think it's sort of a constellation of factors at multiple levels of social ecology. So in other words, at your individual, your peer, your school, mm-hmm. family, community level that combine and you as an individual that may increase your propensity. Um, and then I think that is in tandem with potentially protective factors. So mm-hmm. what factors might in the um, face of these risk factors, reduce the likelihood. So, you know, maybe then um, you also have some really good, um, maybe even if you have a a family that modeled um, some more aggressive behaviors, but you have a group of friends who really doesn't engage in bullying, you may be less likely to engage in bullying. So I think that's what the Mm. complicated piece is. It's really so many factors. and um, you're looking at how they would both increase or decrease your risk. Um, trying to think, Jen, would I? I'll just add one of the things that we've thought a lot about, and you were involved in a study on this, is stability of involvement right. in bullying over That's time. True. So we um, are more concerned about students who are um, involved in relationships as a bully in multiple different Context, so like mm-hmm. in school and in after school and in summer camp or wherever they're kind of in all the different spaces where they are, and over time, um, when when we see students who are kind of involved consistently, that's more concerning than when someone's in a particular context that kind of pulls that out of them. Um, so uh, that's another just layer to think about when we're thinking about how to support students. And I'd say similarly with students who are being targeted, um, the students who are more concerned about are the students who are targeted across multiple years and classrooms and different settings that they're in than the ones who kind of are in an environment where that has come up for them, but it, it doesn't extend beyond that environment. Mm. I just had a uh, random thought I'm going to run by you, <laughs> hypothesizing for a study maybe. Um, do you think that people who have one fixed identity um, are more prone to being a bully, are, being, are more prone to bullying others? Meaning that if on the other side of that, conversely, if you have multiple identities, meaning that like um, you're exposed to different types of people and you have friendships with different types of people from different groups, whether it's racial, ethnic, or sexual orientation in general, all that stuff, it, do, different cultures, do you think that by nature of having relationships with different types of people that makes people less prone to bullying other people? Just hypothesizing. It's a good question. I can't think of any research that really speaks to that. Um because it probably builds a lot of empathy and the ability to like appreciate different types of people rather than look down on other types of people. I think it's an interesting question. I think um, we we all probably have multiple identities and um, and that especially for young people that they're mm-hmm. evolving and dynamic over time. Um, but I'm also not familiar with any research on it. But I would think that maybe um, having the experience of being both in a majority and a minority context mm-hmm. might be um, an important piece of that in terms of, kind of understanding different social dynamics and, and experiences. Mm-hmm. So um, I would just kind of add that to the research question mm-hmm. that you were already thinking of posing. Right. 
That's a good, right. that's a good point. And I think to Jen's earlier point, I think there is a relatively small group of kids who remain engaged in high levels of perpetration or remain in high levels of victimization steadily over time. Mm -hmm. That's just a smaller group of kids. Um, and those are the ones we're most concerned about for sure. Mm -hmm. And the kids who are both perpetrators and victims are the smallest group generally. And those who remain in that group over time um, are the very most concerning group of kids. Um, but there's a fair amount of fluidity in... Um, in those, in any of those roles, yeah, that's a good point. I imagine too, Jared, the 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 exposure to different people, getting to know d different people who have had different experiences across different points of their life. There might be some more cognitive and psychological flexibility that those individuals are starting to develop, which might be a little bit more expansive in how they think about different situations and relationships. And I love that, Jen. You're you're talking about bullying in the form of a relationship because i think that's the key point that it's something that's sustained it's not just a one-off mm -hmm. experience and i think i think in especially i'm going to bring it up in this digital world i think people have um a different perspective on what relationships are mm. right there might be a lot of children especially who you know their frontal lobes aren't fully developed they can't actually see the bigger picture of things they they don't actually understand that, you know, having somebody follow you on a social media app and having a few in exchanges or interactions isn't necessarily a relationship, mm -hmm. though it can be incredibly influential on them. And I think from a developmental perspective, too, thinking about how young people are mm. defining relationships and how that can potentially lead into these more vulnerable situations where bullying could potentially be more present whether they recognize or realize it or not. Yeah, and the um, the issue of social media and cyberbullying has presented challenges in thinking about how to define what mm. bullying is even. Mm. Um, so this idea of repetition, um, whereas when you're thinking about in-person bullying, you think about repetition, meaning there can be multiple interactions that are negative. When you're thinking about social media, if someone posts something once, but then 100 people or 1,000 people view it, mm. um, does that feel, does that have the same impact of feeling repetitive, even though the action only um, occurred once? And so I think your question about how does social media shift, how we think about what relationships feel like to young people is a really important one. That's such a good point. And I think Lex too, you're suggesting that um, if you're bullying someone and people are liking you, mm. like, oh, you're popular in life because you're bullying other kids, you're so cool or whatever, right? That that relationship with the person who's telling you you're cool or on social media liking your post when you're bullying someone else because people are looking at it and giving you like validation because or whatever attention basically just attention um that that's not actually a real relationship mm. right so the, the the person doing the bullying as you're suggesting and we're all suggesting maybe maybe really has a really skewed view of what a relationship is mm. it's not just people fawning over you and saying oh you're so cool because you're bullying someone else like that's the opposite of a real relationship and that's what as human beings we all crave in life is a real relationship and and perhaps the kids who are doing the bullying just you know sometimes this stuff is modeled and they maybe in their personal life hasn't had a model or have the experience of having a real genuine relationship to understand what that really means I think to the point of the theme of this this season is about connection. And and I think bullies especially, they feel connected when they are oftentimes perpetrating these behaviors and, and putting down different individuals who become victimized. But I think to your point too, um, Melissa, what you were saying before that when you see this modeled, so many kids have access to see a lot of this modeled all the time at their fingertips, whether it's directly in their direct community in their physical presence or not, oftentimes they're seeing this happen in the videos that are displayed on social media where they might not have that direct exposure, but then it becomes direct exposure. So it's so interesting to think about all of these influences. And I'm, I'm focusing on the influences because I actually think that that's a big proponent of what we could potentially control and help, especially through mental health, like Jerry was referring to, through having these conversations with young people to help them just understand like how this impacts you and the people around you and and how we can maybe, <laughs> this is a bigger question that we're not going to be able to tackle today. How can we maybe maybe influence 
you know, this this whole idea of social media in a more positive way where maybe it's not as accessible, maybe it's not as, maybe how could we like diminish that <laughs> power that it has over so many young people and adults alike that we have so much exposure to so much, positive or negative, and sometimes it's hard to distinguish which is which. Mm. It's not really a question there. It's just like mm-hmm. a, a lot of things. I mean, a lot of questions, I think, built into that one statement, kind of picking on all that you do and all that you think about, because I'm sure these are conversations you're having in your lab all the time. You know, all the time and with schools and school staff all the time, too, mm-hmm. who are trying to figure out how do you support young people in navigating these contexts that are different from what the adults around them, in many cases, were navigating mm. themselves as as youth. And it, I think I think the questions you're asking are really um, critical. And also the answers to them will keep shifting as <laughs> the nature of what um, we have access to is, is shifting quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. I think, you know, I guess what I'm really getting to, and I hear like countless parents that I work with in the back of my head, you know, just frustrated over, you know, the the phone use, the, the social media use, because they're fearful of others bullying and taking advantage of their child and also potentially some impulsive moves that a child might make that could come across as something that is aggressive or negative or harmful. And, you know, I think it's, I think this is a conversation. I always say, you know, it's not all or nothing. You can't just have zero tolerance and just take everything away because they're going to find a way to have access or it might come out in a different way. But like, what are the basis of the conversations that you think are most important and relevant to helping young people, especially understand, I guess, how their behaviors and actions impact others? From a bullying perspective, obviously, because it can, you know, metastasize, I guess, into bullying, even if it is just aggression or frustration that might be coming out. I'm happy to yeah, jump in or if you want to yes. start. No, no, you can start. Um, I, um, I, I think that you know, the basis of it is talking to to our young people about what it looks like to be a friend um, mm. and what friendship means and what bullying is and what it is not and to talk to them explicitly about what it looks like in different contexts and what it looks like in person is is just by its nature different from what it looks like online. Um, And many parents monitor their child's um, cell phone use or social media use. I think that's really important, especially for young teens, uh, for parents and other adults to be involved and um, helping youth to navigate their use of these um, of these platforms and to know what it looks like when someone is 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 posting something that might be bullying and how to respond to that and giving them kind of real time coaching around those topics and you mentioned concern about what their own kids might post too so showing examples and talking about um, not if you see something that's concerning but when you see something that's concerning um, how are you going to manage that how Will you come and talk to me about it? How are we going to process this together? Um, and being um, willing to build those lines of communication with um, with children so that they feel like they can come forward and process them with the adults around them. That's such a great point. I, I was imagining in my head, you know, walking down a beautiful street and like suggesting to the child, like, oh, this might make for a great post mm-hmm. versus like letting them kind of go for it. Like the educational coaching piece and helping them to understand you know, what is applicable, what is appropriate and what is not. Because I think, you know, the way in which they present themselves as Jerry was describing, like finding out who they are, I think is so important. Yeah, I was just going to add, I think all these points are so important. And I, just to add for for listeners, I think there also can be a perception that cyberbullying is so much higher than in-person mm-hmm. bullying. So I think we always also like to know that interestingly, in-person bullying still remains the more common form. Now, to Jen's point earlier, that doesn't mean cyberbullying is not necessarily reaching more people given the way in which mm-hmm. it can extend or could have its own set of consequences. I think that's also important to note. But um, I do think sometimes families wonder about if that is occurring to at such higher rates. And interestingly, um, unless Jen speak to, speak to this, if I've... There. They're kind of merging in terms of how common they are now. Merging a bit, but it's not, I think there can be a perception that higher billing is like five times as high mm. um, and that that's not. But again, I, I do think it's also important to contextualize that in terms of 
what it can feel like or the experience of it like in cyberbullying is different than in school bullying. So that was to your earlier point, Jen, that I think that's a that's an important piece yeah. that cyberbullying can reach many more people in an instant. Mm. So it has a different quality to it. Yeah, there's, um, a, there's some evidence that since the pandemic, there's been a decline in in-person bullying, um, right. but an increase in cyberbullying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that that has continued even with schools right. back in session. Right. right. Well, it's like the more access people have, the, the vulnerable ones are the ones who are affected most, right? Those who are more prone to that impulsivity to do something that hurts someone else. It's like access. Access always makes things harder, right? I mean, um, WBUR interviewed me about online gambling and how it's legalized now. And my suggestion was like, I've seen gambling like ruin people's lives. And like, as much as we're celebrating the tax revenue, there's plenty of people who are more vulnerable to having their lives ruined from this. And so I think we always got to think about like, if there's more access to something, doesn't mean there, there's pros and cons to everything. And the con usually is the vulnerable people, that population of the vulnerable are more likely to be negatively affected by something. I will also say I love that you brought up the bullying aspect in that too, that sometimes the athletes or the coaches might have other influences on people like, like you know, the, the chirping, I guess, <laughs> from the social media, Twitter, what do they call them? Trolls that are like going after them being like, oh, you should have done better because there is a different kind of investment in the relationship with especially sports and athletics. Yeah, and there's a lot of pieces to that too. That's what I referred to in the interview is like um, people are willing to say literally anything online because there's like a mask. Mm -hmm. It's like you don't, you're not face to face with someone. So there's plenty of things that you would never say to someone face to face because you'd be too afraid to. But when you're online, you say like the worst things. And that's why I feel like um, maybe I'm biased is thinking like, oh, like this generation growing up with social media is more malicious than in the past and the ones doing the bullying. But I'm wondering if that's true just by nature of like you're more people are more willing to do things that are worse um, because of the uh, the uh, an- an- anonymity of the, the being anonymous um, behind the screen and not having to confront someone. That's what I said about these athletes. These poor athletes are online and the guy doing the game, whoever's doing the gambling is like, you lost me a thousand dollars. I'm angry at you. I'm going to like say the worst things I can ever possibly say to you online. Um, he would, they would never say that to their face or if they would, I mean, bad things might happen. Yeah. I mean, certainly see that, certainly see that come across the board that people post things that they wouldn't necessarily say in person because it's, it's easy in person to see the, or easier in person to see the impact that it has on someone else if I say something, but you're right when you post, um, on social media, even if you know who the person is, you're not observing their reaction to it and you don't get the same feedback about how, how hurtful potentially mm-hmm. something you say has been to somebody else. Definitely. So I know that um, you both focus a lot on like the school climate and the environment of the school. Maybe we can focus a little bit about that. Um, you know, certainly kids feeling like there's a belongingness within the school system. Um, there's not this hierarchical structure where like this group is considered more important, more powerful than these other groups. Like there's kind of a equal, I think this is probably where my, my other comment came from. If you can uh, relate with different groups of people where you treat them as equals rather than like this group is better than that group or more important, whatever that, that can maybe reduce bullying. So maybe you can talk about that in terms of Um, addressing bullying because I know as we said it's super complex to address bullying and the research suggests um, there's some progress in helping it but um, it's such a complex issue that um, there's not really this silver bullet that's going to make it stop right yeah I mean I guess just to to start with what you said from the big picture you know there have been quite a number of studies looking at bullying prevention programs and while overall there is evidence of some effectiveness. It, there is not as much effectiveness as one would think if you look at the collection of studies overall and take a look at the the change. But there are some programs that have shown to be effective at improving school climate, reducing some bullying, and so forth. But I would say it's a very small handful of of of, of, of programs that do that. Um, but those, to your point, generally do have an impact on climate, which in turn will and start to address the behaviors. Um, and I think it's important, as you said, those, those programs sort of start to address um, the whole school climate. So we know the programs that address 
sort of that are whole school in nature that get everyone involved at the school so that everyone can be on board in creating that climate of safety are the ones that are going to be more effective. So everyone from folks who are working in um, the lunchroom to, you know, teachers to counselors to if there's bus drivers in the community, um, those are going to be more effective because it needs to be everyone on board in terms of having those set of shared values that are created um, to create, you know, spaces in which kids feel that sense of belonging, um, feel um, that they can come to school safety, safely um, and so forth. So that is definitely a key element of programs that we know are effective. I'm going to kind of relate this almost like a metaphor for people who are involved in sports. Like a new coach comes onto a team to coach the team and they want to change, quote unquote, change the culture. That it like takes a lot of time to do that, to build that. And I think, Melissa, your point is like everybody getting on board with shared values of respect. Um, I always think respect is like, in my opinion, should be the word that everybody uses when we talk about this. Um, I think everybody can agree that respect is important. To some degree, I think everybody can, different opinion, different people from different sides can agree. Respect is kind of a common value that we can uh, agree to. But um, I'm imagining like if you're a school staff, it might be hard to think that anything you're going to do is going to help it to make it better. Um, it's almost like, you know, being a therapist, right? Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to help someone's mental health problems in one session or even with one thing I say. So I've had to learn to step back and see the big picture and to say, this is a whole process that has to take place and it's a collaborative process. And, um, I had to be in tune with that process. So I'm wondering like how important it is for everybody to kind of understand that it's a process rather than like, we have to fix this or, you know, like to, there's some, you know, that kind of way of thinking about it. I think you're right that change takes time, but I personally can think about teachers who had a really huge impact on my life, even in in one year. And mm. I think that teachers may not always like, see that day to day, but um, but I hope that they can over time or and have enough like, former students coming back and um, sharing with them know that they they do really um, mm. have an effect on the climate of their classroom mm-hmm. and the students' experiences. Um, for that year at least, and and in many cases going on much longer past the time in their classroom from the things that they've learned and the skills they've developed in the classroom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, And I just think another point that I wanted to raise is that it's not just about, uh, as you were saying before, it's not just about reducing bullying or stopping bullying. Really, we want Mm -hmm. our students to walk into school every day feeling like, feeling connected, feeling Mm -hmm. like they belong, feeling like school is a place for them and reflects who they are as a whole person and that they are valued and that what they're doing in that setting is meaningful. Um, so reducing bullying is important, but it's it needs to be part of this bigger picture of the, the kinds of mm. places where we want our children to be spending their days every day. I love that, yeah. You're so right, though. Like one comment a teacher can make or one relationship you have with one student can be humongous and like we all remember our favorite teachers <laughs> and that's a special thing yeah and and um and uh, the research on perceived social support for people who are being bullied from what i recall right even on our research with that college study that we did just thinking that you have support even if it's not happening in the moment just thinking oh this person really cares about me and is going to support me is powerful for mental health. It actually really is a really important factor for people's mental health, even if they're being victimized by being bullied. Mm-hmm. When I think if you think particularly at the elementary school level, if you're in a class for most of the day, I think that teacher can have a lot of um, sway over your perceived climate. You know, I think it gets, I think even at the high school level, though, if you have one teacher that you can find a connection to, that's also really important. Um, that teacher may have less of an impact over your overall experience of a climate, but we know that having connection with one school staff member is really, you know, vital to how you're going to experience school as well. Yeah, we have a paper where we um, were working in a school district and we were doing as kind of a social emotional survey for students and we asked them to list the teachers who they felt most connected to or felt like they could go to if they were having a, a problem, that an emotional problem that they wanted help with. And then we compiled um, that list for the school of the top teachers who students were going to. And we said, why don't, to the school staff, why don't you reach out to these teachers? A lot of students are going to them and asking them, why don't you reach out to the teachers and hear about what, what they're doing, how they're supporting students mm-hmm. and whether there are other supports that they 
need. And and not surprisingly to all of us who have gone through, this was at a high school, who've gone through high school, there were a few teachers who over and over again, students that they would go to and um, who were really important to them. So we wanted to make sure that those teachers felt like they they had support and that they knew that they were serving a really valuable role within the school environment. So one of the cures is relationships. When there's mm-hmm. a bad relationship, a healthy relationship can be the cure sometimes mm-hmm. for one individual, yeah. It's definitely a protective factor. And it's so nice to hear the, um, these stories from the different schools. And I'm thinking about my experience in, in helping in school change. I do a lot of work training educators around the world about universal design for learning and executive function, social emotional learning in particular. And you're right, it, it is such a process. But the the changes that end up getting implemented and the ones that I have found both from a teacher professional development perspective, and also in working with the students that I work with and hearing their stories, the thing that most really is the most powerful is beyond just the relationship is the adults in the room who show up embodying the things that they're teaching, embodying the programs that have been implemented in the schools. Those Mm -hmm. who not only are doing the strategies or teaching the lessons, but really try to be more curious and open about improving themselves to be able to allow for the children and the students to be able to improve themselves too. And I imagine too, and and I'd love to hear more about your recent work um, in the schools, thinking about what you have seen as like one of the the biggest factors or one of, I hate boiling it down to one thing. It's never one thing. It's so nuanced. I get it. But like what has been most um, profound in your research and work that you've noticed in the schools that you have seen the most change in the culture and the climate to be able to, again, not to reduce bullying, but to improve the sense of self and the, the idea of community? Either way, I'm happy to answer if you well, want to. I'm start with probably a, maybe it's more of an organizational point and then Jen maybe has something more nuanced to add to this. I mean, I think for me, when I think back about our work with schools, I think one of the biggest factors that will promote success in terms of working towards change would just sort of be the school being ready Mm. to want to change. Mm. Um, So our partnerships have emerged um, and started in various ways. But if we start working with a school who says we've noticed there's a challenge, we'd like to address it, we're ready to address it, then the partnership tends to be more successful and the collaboration around what happens moving forward tends to be more successful. That may not directly answer your question, but that's the first thing that came to mind. And that's great. Yeah. That's such a great point. And I'd say having um, a community of people who are ready to make change. We've we've certainly been in schools where um, there's been a, a champion for the change, but it is so helpful when um, groups in the community have come together or, or even done work around building consensus around what, um, what the challenges are and, and how they want to move forward. Mm-hmm. So Melissa and Jen, maybe you can share a little bit about your research uh, regarding the bias-based bullying and also eventually kind of segueing into the bystander and how important that is with uh, helping. Yeah, um, so I can start out and then can turn it over to Jen. So Jen and I, along with others, have been collaborating on um, a project with the National Institute of Justice where we're looking at um, bias-based harassment. So in other words, we can think about that as bullying based on someone's form of identity, whether that's their race, their religion, their gender identity. Um, and we've been um, following adolescents longitudinally to understand sort of the prevalence of this um, kind of exposure, um, as well as how it relates to functioning. But there actually haven't been a lot of studies even looking at the prevalence of bias-based harassment. And so that was one of the first things we want to take a look at. And Jen actually took a lead on the paper that is about to come out, I believe, Jen. We just were looking at the page proofs of that the other day. Um, so I thought it might be um, interesting for listeners to hear about just some of those um, initial findings. So in the study of about 650-ish adolescents across the United States, we found that 28% reported bias-based harassment victimization. So it's about one in three, um, which is not surprising to the extent that we know in our country generally um, paralleling um, the rise in hate crimes. We might expect that these things are also going on in schools. Um, And similarly, 12% reported perpetrating bias-based harassment um, as well. Um, And just to note, the most frequent forms of bias-based victimization were those targeted at race, sexual orientation, and gender identity. 
Um, and also importantly, when we took a look at whether um, these forms overlapped, in other words, did kids who reported one also tend to report another, we did find that there was um, substantial overlap in forms of victimization. Um, in line with bullying generally, we did find that students with minoritized identities were generally more likely to report bias-based victimization. Um, and often, you know, not only just based on their particular identities. So as one example, uh, we found that gender diverse youth reported more victimization, not only due to their gender identity, but also as well because of their religion. Um, something that Jen may want to expand on more, one of the one particularly interesting findings from the study were that students with disabilities reported uh, high rates of bias-based uh, victimization in four of the six forms we looked at. So they reported high rates um, based on national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, and immigration status. And they were also more likely to target, um, or sorry, to report perpetrating bias-based harassment across multiple forms. Um, so this was an important, um, this has been an important study for us because again, we feel like just sort of, you know, countrywide with these higher rates of hate crimes, and we see this all the time in the news. Um, this is similarly going on in the schools, and it's really important for us to be thinking about um, what's going on and how to address it. But Jenna, I don't know if there's other pieces that are important to think about in the study and from our work. Yeah, just um, research has consistently shown that bias-based bullying is uh, has associated with worse outcomes than general bullying. That mm. feeling um, like you're being targeted because of who you are, because of your identity, mm. is just a really awful, awful experience for um, youth to have. Mm. And um, so we've we've been really very interested in learning more about this experience and some research on bullying, including some research that we've done, has kind of looked at bullying in general and not focused on the content of the bullying. And so um, we've been really interested in kind of delving into what what is the content of the bullying? What is it targeting? How is it um, making people feel and how that um, and how that impacts different, subgroups of youth. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'll say that the finding about disabilities, which you highlighted, Melissa, um, is one that we have seen in other forms of bullying. So students with disabilities are disproportionately involved in forms of bullying generally um, and in all different roles as um, targets and as aggressors in bullying relationships. And so we're able to show here that the same is true for bias-based bullying and harassment. And um, kind of leads us into conversation about how schools and how communities support um, students with a range of abilities, and um, and also in thinking about again functional what what are the functional um, skills that students need to have supported um, in terms of building their their skills around peer relationships. Yeah, and I realized there's one more thing that I thought it'd be important to highlight from this study is that. Another thing we looked at was um, sort of what we call witnessed bias-based bullying. So in other words, if you're a student who hears comments um, that are derogatory, and we looked at that group of kids and we took out kids who had experienced it directly, and we looked at whether kids who are just hearing these comments, if they're affected in terms of their mental health, and we found out that they they were affected. Mm. Um, and we thought that was really important to say that if you're in a school in which you're hearing these comments, this affects you, this affects all kids. Um, which again, you know, it makes sense, um, but um, it's important for schools to keep in mind as they think about providing programs um, around uh, identity-based bullying, bias-based bullying, and how to support the kids within um, the school context presently. Mm. So in, in light of that, um, maybe you can share a little bit about the bystander-based interventions and kind of how they function within the system of supporting kids who have been victimized or targeted by being bullied um, and what you know even peers can do. Maybe we, we didn't focus too much on what peers can do. So, okay, Can you also just define bystander for the audience? So bystander meaning anybody who is witnessing or is aware of um, the fact that the bullying is yeah. happening. Um, I always think of like the number one thing being like, who's the popular kid? Who's like a good kid or like has the potential to be like a leader to speak up and to use power for good? Because if power could be used for maliciousness, power could also be used for benevolence. And I'm always thinking about mm. about that and creative ways of doing that because it's, you know, there, there are times and I've, I've heard a patient, um, multiple patients sometimes say like, well, I try to stick up for someone and then like I got bullied and just kind of like didn't help and like they just kind of irritated them. And, and maybe that's 
there's there's so many nuances as to why that happened. It could have been like you know the context, the school. It could have been the way it was done. Like who knows? Like there could have been a lot of reasons for it. But it's just um, I'm just thinking of just ways that people can use their their power for for benevolence um, in creative ways too. I don't, there's probably a lot of different ways it can happen. Yeah, I think to your point, John, earlier on Piers, Jerry, it's a good one that, um, you know, sometimes I think that kids can get the message that the only way they can proactively be a bystander or help a peer is to stand up in that moment. And I think that for lots of reasons, that may not be safe for a child or really to good outcomes for that child or their friends. So I think, you know, when we think about how kids can help someone being victimized, we can think if if they feel like they have the agency and they're safe of, of intervening at the moment, but there's other ways that kid can help, you know, supporting the kid in the private moment, going with the kid to the office to report it. Um, you know, so there's other avenues. So providing the message that the only, it, so not only providing the message that you can stand up in the moment, but here's the other ways you can help a friend who's experienced that. I think is important because most often we're going to find that kids aren't going to feel comfortable saying something in the moment, and that's okay for sure um, for good reason. Yeah, going up to someone after and saying, "I saw what happened back there. That wasn't cool." Yeah, I mean that's a way that you can support as a bystander, um, or walking with someone to the for teacher to the nurse's office to the principal's office are all ways that students can support each other. Yeah. 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 We always say on the podcast, like complex problems don't really, uh, like it's a simple solution sometimes and not the answer to a complex problem. Sometimes you can need to think creatively and collaborative and collaboratively with people. Um, like I'm even thinking of some people I've worked with, like kids where like the solution was, uh, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like, um, a silver bullet where everything became better, but things got a little bit better or, you know, and it just took time to figure that out. And, and certainly the parents being kind of calm through the process too, I think is helpful. Cause I think this is very activating for a parent. You know, you got to think of the perspective of everybody involved and like to think that your kid is being bullied is, is scary, sad, upsetting. You know, you want to be protective over your kids. So I think, um, you know, the advice to parents too is to kind of manage how you're reacting to it, not only to model kind of the, the kind of clear thinking, collaboration and flexible thinking that it might require, but also to, um, to, to uh, encourage the kid to do the same. So um, there's a lot of nuances that probably could be helpful, um, which is why, you know, I always advocate access a psychotherapist, uh, therapist, psychologist, counselor that could kind of create the context to have these conversations because, Alexis and I always say like communication is the fundamental, is the foundation of a lot of stuff that goes that you go through in life. You know, we need to practice communicating and it's hard to communicate. Nobody likes to communicate about things that they're suffering with. So, you know, I think the school, this, you know, even a, a coach, you know, um, parent, a sibling, an older sibling, like create context where kind of these validating, calmer, uh, uh, creative thinking, uh, c- collaborative conversations can happen to to figure out the nuances of what to do about it. And the answers may not be one thing. It may be a couple different things. And it might be trial and error too. I think too that the communication piece is key because not everybody can really understand even what they're experiencing in a moment. They might, or in, in a series of moments, which could compound and become something more. So I think it's, you know, to summarize some of the points that were made that, you know, bullying as a whole is about a power differential that happens multiple times over time, but it's not just the individual. It really is about the community and the ecological structures around it. And I think from a protective factor, we can also consider how the community and the communication and the connection and the authenticity to show up and to support each other and to be open about things that may come up and be confusing or aggressive or frustrating in a moment to help to kind of diffuse that proactively might actually be one of the antidotes to this bigger systemic issue that we're seeing in bullying and thinking about how we can all play a role in the (laughs) the ecosphere the, the thinking about the entire the entirety of a child's life and to be able to practice compassion empathy curiosity listening to not just be about those big moments that don't always go well or things that feel really hard, but to really think about both sides of the same coin. And, you know, I, I think often about those who struggle most because they often are the ones who will aggress. Um, and, and how can we soften their experience so that it doesn't impact others as much? And I wonder if, uh, you know, this is kind of 
the big points that I'm pulling from the conversation. And I'm so grateful for you sharing, first of all, for doing all the work that you do, because it's so impressive and amazing and empowering for so many, not only in the field, but in school systems, families at home and for the children you reach as well. But, you know, from everything that we kind of pulled together, any closing thoughts or big points that you think are really crucial to be able to communicate and share? I think I think the Im- importance, and I think this is happening, but the importance of taking experiences of bullying seriously and mm-hmm. for um, adults to to listen to the perspectives of children and hear what they're saying um, about how they're experiencing peer relationships and being willing to um, support youth and to help to really figure out and investigate what what's going on, um, what is the young person's perspective and the relationships and um, what can be happening, not just at, as you were saying, at the individual level to support um, the student, but to shift the context and the culture um, around them to to support them and their development socially and emotionally and also um, in in establishing contexts that are caring and supportive and mm. places where people feel like, uh, where young people feel like they belong and are seen and, and valued. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think to echo to some of what Jen said, I think um, just as this podcast is doing, I think providing opportunities for education, both mm. to understand exactly what bullying is um, so that, that that schools can better intervene and and also to help families understand sort of to Jen what, what Jen was saying when a child is coming to you that it makes sense that they're experiencing X, Y, and Z symptoms. This is very common when you're, um, experiencing bullying, or here's the signs a, a family member might look for if their child is not feeling comfortable coming and telling them that this is happening. You know, this this is what your child might be displaying, and maybe here's the kinds of questions you may want to ask to find out if they might be victimized, if they might be perpetrating. So I think education um, is key, similarly for the schools. How can we think about programs to create that kind of safe and nurturing environment um, that allows all students to feel connected? Yeah, I, I, I'm so appreciative to have Melissa and Jen here. Uh, it's like a dream that like we all started together. I started with you both, and we have this conversation, and it just feels so natural um, to talk about this important topic. And for all those who are listening, if you have been bullied or if you've been engaged in it or you know someone, like I hope it feels good to know that like these two psychologists are dedicating their career to figuring this out, um, and hopefully that feels validating too. Um, my closing remark maybe would be, um, bullying peaks during, um, middle school years. And so, uh, I think most people in life will think of middle school as a very like strange, tumultuous time. <laughs> and there's developmentally a reason for that. Everybody's like growing up and starting to think about relationships, starting to think about who they are in relation to other people. And that's where that social hierarchy starts to become developed more potently, which is why we see bullying more often is because people are more thinking about who they are in relation to other people because their brains are developing to think that way. And so for those thinking about this developmentally, just know that like it does decrease over time. And I, I'm a big, you know, hopeful person in terms of hope that there is, you know, things can change over time. We all f- experience strong emotions when bad things happen and it feels like this is going to happen forever or it's always going to happen or things are always going to be terrible. And um, just want to uh, in, in shed some array of hope that things could, could get better and certainly take care of yourself because if you take care of yourself along the way, while you're going through hard times and after them, your life could get better, right? But don't be passive in that process. We all need to help ourselves and excess help and allow ourselves to be vulnerable to, to let people help us and to help ourselves. And and because, you know, as you go graduate from high school and, and get older, right, your life will change, your context will change, the people in your life will change and you can have new opportunities. And I'm just really advocating for that proactivity. Take care of yourself, um, get help, use help, um, love yourself, you know, have uh, optimism for the possibility that there is change uh, and, and so forth. I will say that it is definitely a journey. And like I always say, I don't ever feel like I can get rid of the darkness, but I can continue to shed and shine my light as brightly as I can. 
to hopefully mute some of the darkness that exists. So hopefully we can try to find that balance and equilibrium by sharing and shining our lights a little bit brighter each day. So thank you for contributing to that. We're so grateful for you both. Thank, thank you for you. having us. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to the Read Connected podcast. Please remember that this is a podcast intended to educate and share ideas, but it is not a substitute for professional care that may be beneficial to you at different points of your life. If you are in need of support, please contact your primary care physician, local hospital, educational institution, or support staff at your place of employment to seek out referrals for what may be most helpful for you. Ideas shared here have been shaped by many years of training, incredible mentors, research, theory, evidence-based practices, and our work with individuals over the years, but it's not intended to represent opinions of those we work with or who we are affiliated with. The Reconnected podcast is hosted by siblings Alexis Reed and Dr. Gerald Reed. Original music is written and recorded by Gerald Reed. Editing and recording was done by Cybersound Studios. If you want to follow along on this journey with us, the Reconnected podcast will be releasing new episodes every two weeks each season. So please subscribe for updates and notifications. Feel free to also follow us on Instagram at Read Connected Podcast. That's Read Connect Ed Podcast and Twitter at Read Connect Ed. We are grateful for you joining us and look forward to future episodes. In the meanwhile, be curious, be open, and be well. Mm-hmm.